Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Well, uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon on this uh, on this webinar. Um, over, all of us on our team are obviously at home, so apologies if we get any uh, comedy entrances from children or pets as we go through uh, go through the talk this afternoon. Um, this is the first time I've used this software, so hopefully uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll run smoothly as we go through it. Um, at at uh, your end, we've um, disabled um, videos and uh, microphones. Uh, that's just to try to ensure that the stability of the connection for everyone uh, stays as good as possible. Um, as we go um, through uh, the webinar. You can see on the right hand side of your screen, hopefully, uh, Q&A section. Uh, please do feel free to ask questions as we go through. Uh, those uh, questions will pop up at our end and uh, one of the team will be reviewing those and we'll uh, pick some of those questions as we get towards the end of the, uh, the, end of the webinar. Uh, those questions are anonymous so people can't see what you're, you're writing so apart from us so please do feel free to ask any questions that you want as you, uh, as you, as you, as you go through. Um, I'm going to just move to the first slide, which just reiterates some of those housekeeping points. Before I go any further, I wanted to introduce the various names you should see at the bottom of your uh, screen. Uh, so I'm going to be doing um, uh, the talk today with Anna Parker. Uh, I head up the Farms, Estates and Rural Land team at Foot Anstey and deal uh, a lot with our relationship with the NFU. Anna Parker heads up our Tax and Trusts team and she'll be doing uh, the second part of uh, today's talk. Uh, but one of the advantages of the webinar format is that I can call another team members during their during their lunch break to uh, to help out and answer any specific questions as and when they come up. So some other names at the bottom of the screen you can see. Uh, Danielle Spalding. Danielle's a member of my team, deals a lot with property related disputes. Um, also on the call is Emily Botham. Emily's uh, the newest member of our team, just joining us a few weeks ago. We've not actually met in person, but someday we will, uh, I'm sure. Uh, Emily's one of our matrimonial uh, lawyers based out of Exeter. And then also we've got uh, Holly Meville Hawkins, who's uh, joining us from Bristol area. Uh, she's a member of our mental capacity team, acting in cases where individuals have lost or are losing uh, mental uh, capacity. So, um, the final point I just want to mention on housekeeping is if you are having any uh, IT issues uh, at your end, uh, we should also be seeing them at our end because we're all in different locations, so hopefully we can pick those up. If anything specific that comes up that you think uh, we can help with, please do pop it in the Q&A section as we go through, but uh, hopefully this will run um, smoothly. And we'll try to keep to the 45 minutes or so that we've, uh, we have set aside. So, with... Uh, that in mind, uh, we'll kick off. And to start with, we're going to um, uh, do a couple of polls. Uh, if you may. So uh, the first question, uh, we'd all like some engagement from the audience on this. Uh, you'll have some options on your screen to answer both these questions. And the first one has uh, has just popped up, and that's what percentage of the British population uh, do not have wills. So if everyone can uh, tick their guess or their, their knowing answer and uh, and press submit. I can't actually see if the uh, if everyone has done that yet actually. Anna, can you? Hi Ed, yes I can see the results of the poll coming in. How have you seen the poll? So um, nobody's gone for 22%, so you're obviously all alive to the fact that um, lots of people are not paying due attention to their succession needs. Um, we've got a handful who have gone for 76%, um, but the vast majority, so 84%, have said that 54% of the population do not currently have a will. Okay, good. And then we... Uh, the next question, which we'll start pulling now, is what percentage of UK marriages end in divorce? This is based on statistics before lockdown. Um, uh, hopefully, it'll be too much of a rise in divorces over the next few weeks, but that's the uh, next one. So, if everyone can tick their answer, and we can see, they're still coming in. Eh? Yes, can see, can see the answers coming in. Yes, I've now worked out where I can see that on the screen. Yes, yeah, so the vast, uh, so yeah, most people have gone for uh, C, 42%, which is the uh, which is correct answer based on some uh, recent stats. Um, I'm glad that that worked relatively smoothly. Um, th those two questions really, are just really to get people thinking about um, some of the challenges that uh, you know, some of the drivers for uh, these things. Sadly, 
many marriages do end up in divorce uh, and those these sorts of factors um, come up in the disputes that we uh, deal with. So moving on to the main body of the uh, the talk and just where a background, I, my main area of work is dealing with disputes and very often that is in instances where succession planning has gone wrong or there hasn't been indeed adequate uh, succession planning. So for the purposes of this talk, we've come up with a, a fictional family uh, Boris and Nicola. Uh, Boris is obviously uh, Oxford educated uh, Englishman, uh, got a lot on his plate at the moment and Nicola is uh, uh, from Scotland and they have three children, uh, Jacob, Nigel and Kia. Kia uh, uh, left education at uh, 18. Uh, he's the youngest, he's a new kid on the block. Uh, Jacob and Nigel uh, went on to university. They both earn very good incomes. Uh, neither have been involved in the family farm uh, at all, really, uh, in their adult lives. Uh, Kia, in contrast, has been involved in day to day farming since leaving school and very much takes the lead. He very much uh, viewed it as his, his, uh, his, um, uh, his calling in life to work on the farm. There's been no uh, recent discussion in the family uh, about who will inherit the farm, but Keir always understood it uh, to be him. Uh, he based his whole life uh, around that assumption. He had um, uh, married, brought up his own family uh, on, the, on the farm property. Uh, Boris and Nicola are now saying that Keir won't in fact um, get the farm. He's rather concerned about this. Those are the sorts of facts that we come across um, uh, in all too familiar circumstances these days. And over the last uh, four or five years, there have been a number of court cases go through the courts which have really drawn attention to these types of uh, circumstances. And they have um, really um, uh, uh, driven a lot of public attention to these types of cases which can be run. I put a couple of examples of the headlines that have come up on the slides, uh, uh, come up in recent part times uh, on the slides. The Carousel Edge Cinderella one was one which got uh, particular attention. And what's unusual, what drives these cases, and nearly all these cases are, are farming family related, is you have a family dispute where there is a high value capital asset which sadly towards um, the parents' later years or after they one or more of them have passed away, uh, that capital asset is then the subject of uh, their children having an argument over who is entitled uh, to what. And these, these headlines have really driven a lot of the interest that we see in a lot of queries we get through. And they're always sad stories of where there's been a breakdown in relations and uh, these disputes have arisen. So why are, why are they why are these types of claims uh, particularly uh, particularly a problem for farming uh, farming families? Well, these types of cases are called proprietary estoppel claims, and often coupled with other types of claims as well, relating to uh, claims arising on on death of a of a parent. But we're looking here particularly at proprietary estoppel claims, and they're particularly a problem uh, where there's a high value capital asset, as I've just mentioned, uh, particularly one given that the increases in in farmland values over over recent years. Um, the tensions of a farming family working together can give rise to uh, these problems. Uh, in some cases, there's a tradition that the eldest son might be the one who would inherit the farm and that can give rise to expectations and, and those expectations might not have uh, kept, uh, kept pace with the reality of, of the, that family situation. And there's also uh, where even where there have been discussions or where there haven't been discussions, a lack of formality and documentation setting out what's been agreed um, uh, amongst the family. And that causes tensions and difficulties later on, particularly as people uh, pass away. So these particular claims are uh, called proprietary estoppel um, and it's an equitable remedy and I put on the slide there the real definition. It's, um, it, it operates to prevent the legal owner of a property from asserting their strict legal rights in respect of that property which it would be inequitable to allow them to do so. So really uh, what the court is doing here in these cases is trying to step in and trying to uh, right a wrong where someone has made a promise and they're now seeking to go back on that promise to the real detriment of um, uh, of, of their child. Um, the leading case is one from 2009, it's called Thorner and Mage, but as mentioned before, there have been a large number of other cases over recent years. Uh, in all of these cases, um, you have to show uh, three elements. Uh, there's got to be a promise, uh, that promise is going to be relied upon, and there's got to be that de de detriment. They've got to have suffered something um, uh, because of their reliance on it. Um, you might be surprised to hear that silence can actually do. Um, uh, 
in many of the cases we deal with, we come up with this a question as to who said what and uh, what and when and how it, how things were put. But very often you can see you can point to a series of actions uh, which evidence that someone uh, at the entire family were operating on an assumption that this per particular person would, in, would inherit the farm. But you might not be able to point to some specific uh, occasion when a promise was made. But silence can do. Um, so the promise uh, or assurance, the, going to keep the elements of this in a little more detail, uh, the promise or assurance um, uh, can be uh, done in various ways, statements of sort of along the lines of one day this will all be yours um, uh, would obviously suffice. The cow shed Cinderella case I mentioned uh, in one of the earlier slides, which is the case of Davis and Davis from a couple of years ago now, in that particular one, uh, the father had made uh, an announcement on the opening of a new dairy unit um, that they would um, uh, that their daughter would be taking on uh, the business. So that was a very clear uh, piece of evidence that the promise had been made. The promise um, has to be clear. Uh, so it has to be has to be clear that you can understand exactly what the nature of the promise was and what was actually being uh, assured in, in the statement made. It's got to be relied upon. Um, so um, uh, you've then got to show that uh, you have relied upon that promise in the actions that you've uh, you've taken in terms of how you organise your own personal affairs and how you've um, uh, uh, how you decided to move your own uh, business and personal life uh, forward. Uh, detriment is something that uh, often um, uh, can be something that uh, you need to spend a bit of time considering in these sorts of Lots of claims. Very often there are cases where uh, the individual concerned can point to having given up uh, something of, of uh, real values. So that might be, for example, London or abroad or, or whatever, and then a later point in life return to the family farm on the promise of, in, of inheriting the family farm or in the expectation of doing so. There you can point to them having given up perhaps a more lucrative career or a different, uh, a different career opportunity. Uh, other examples of uh, where detriment comes into it would be uh, where someone leaves school and um, perhaps works at a low wage on the family farm as they build up their experience, get that knowledge, et cetera, uh, over the years. Their, their low income in those periods can be as pointed to as evidence of um, uh, the detriment that they've, uh, uh, that they've, they've suffered. With all these cases, uh, what we've um, what we tend to find is they're extremely difficult to um, to advise on. So when things have gone wrong, and when when there is this dispute within the within the family where uh, one of the children is saying, "I'm entitled to X, Y, and Z, and I'm not receiving it, and this is wrong, and I want it righted." Um, if you are to go to court, there are very hard cases to advise on in terms of what the court is uh, likely to do, because there's a real uh, a real debate as to what is the appropriate uh, measure of the, uh, of the remedy. And on the slide there, I've put a quote from one of the earlier cases where the court summarised the, uh, the, the dilemma that they face, because on one line of authority, they are looking to um, uh, give effect to the expectations. So giving the farm, for example, if, if you're promised the farm, one line of authority would say you should get the farm. The other way of approaching it would be to um, uh, to say that you should be entitled to compensation for the detriment that you have uh, you have suffered, and what they uh, what these cases uh, what the cases show is that they're very very fact specific uh, in terms of the uh, the way in which the courts approach these and approach the way of uh, how they resolve it. And uh, on the slide here, I've got um, the example of one particularly recent, well, fairly recent case now from 18 months or so ago, which again got a reasonable amount of. Um, uh, press. So this is um, uh, uh, this was an important and quite useful case from a few years ago. So Jane and Frank uh, Haverfield, they owned a 220 acre farm uh, in Somerset. Uh, they made various um, uh, promises to uh, to daughter. Uh, she'd spent 30 years working on the farm. Um, she did so on the basis of her late father's assurances that she would take over the dairy business. Business the way she would uh, inherit the entire farm. Uh, there's some com complications, as there very often are, to the factual factual background to these sorts of claims. In, in 2008, she refused an offer uh, to run uh, the farm in partnership with her parents, 
Uh, and then some five years later, after a family dispute, she left the farm. Uh, father died in 2014 and left the farm to uh, his wife, who then closed the uh, closed the dairy uh, dairy unit. So Lucy here was trying to ignore some of that uh, background or put aside, put to one side some of that more complicated background in terms of her declining partnership, etc., to set out her claims based on the expectation the promises made uh, a long time ago. She pointed to factors such as low pay, long hours, few holidays, and the assurances uh, uh, originally made. In this particular case, you also had obviously the fact that mum was still very much alive and needed to be uh, cared for. And in this particular case, the court dealt, um, uh, dealt with it in a very pragmatic way by uh, agreeing a cash payment of 1.17 million to um, uh, to her to allow her to, um, to to be compensated for what she had missed out on. This also enabled mum to um, stay in the stay in the family home, see out see out her life there. So the court took a pragmatic approach. But it is very difficult in these in these cases to advise on what remedy uh, the court will actually award, and very much fact specific. Um, one of the lessons that I've learned from the, dealing with these sorts of cases is that very often uh, the professional costs which can be incurred in dealing with these disputes um, uh, can quickly become disproportionate to the value of the, the property and, uh, and assets that you're debating. To give you one example, on the Davis and Davison case I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, um, I went to talk a couple of years ago by one of the barristers who dealt with that case and um, I can't remember the exact values of the of the farm, but it was a, a decent sized farm in South South Wales. But the legal costs incurred on both sides were well in excess of a, a million pounds. And of course, that very quickly leads you to the conclusion that whatever happens really from the outcome of that, that property will end up being sold to try to, or much of it will end up being sold to try and meet the um, uh, the legal and professional costs which have been uh, incurred. And, uh, and these sort of sad stories do reiterate the need to try to avoid uh, avoid these claims, uh, and at, at, and the core for me, and the the, the main the main uh, the main reason why these things crop up and these problems occur, it's a breakdown in communication and. Um, uh, the key to it is to have those conversations uh, early on uh, in, in in the family to try to plan for the future as to which children or if any children want to um, want to come into the farming business, how that is going to be uh, achieved. It requires very long term planning because if you have two or three children, uh, to make two or three viable farm uh, farming businesses is an enormous is an enormous challenge in this day and age, uh, and that requires a lot of planning as to how you're going to go about doing that. And if one child or two child whatever don't want to get involved in the farming business, how are they going to be uh, fairly treated uh, when it comes to inheritance? These are really difficult uh, judgments, and uh, it requires planning over many 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 years, if not decades, actually to um, to uh, to get it up right. So it's really um, uh, uh, the key to this is actually getting those discussions going as early as possible. Um, one of the uh, one of the specific examples that we often come across, uh, which is very much where uh, 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 Emily is a better place to, uh, than myself when she can address uh, questions later on uh, on this, is in terms of relationship uh, breakdown. So a few years ago, I was involved in the case where uh, you had a, a farming family who had uh, three sons, uh, uh, one of which um, was going through a, a messy divorce. And so that added a layer of complexity to a partnership and family which were already going through a, a difficult uh, a difficult time and, and going their separate ways in terms of uh, how they wanted the business to go forward. Uh, but the addition of a, a divorce into the equation added uh, a significant layer of uh, complexity. And so what we come across these days more and more and more is the uh, introduction into UK law of originally American concept of prenups and postnuptial agreements, which some of you uh, may, may, have, may have heard of, heard of. and they're increasingly, uh, increasingly common. Uh, clients often ask us uh, about them a lot more these days, and we, and we put in place a number of them. They can be done before marriage or after marriage. Um, the key is to make sure that everyone takes proper advice on them, that they're done 
uh, fairly. You really shouldn't be asking someone to sign up to these things the day before they're getting married, because that really uh, doesn't doesn't look good. Uh, and, and the courts uh, the courts do have regard to them when when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, divorce proceedings. But if any more specific questions on 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 that particular topic. Um, Emily is on hand to uh, answer those as we get to the question and answer session uh, a bit later on. Now, hopefully, I'm going to seamlessly hand over to uh, Anna at this point, who's going to talk a little bit more about wills and, uh, and other planning measures that can be put in place to try to avoid the sorts of disputes that I've, um, I've uh, given some examples of in the first part of this. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Edward. Um, I'd like to start by apologising for my rather casual appearance. As I'm sitting on my sofa, this is due to an ongoing dispute with my broadband provider. So I am forced to present this as though I was doing a sort of some kind of breakfast show. Um, but hopefully a little bit of informality will be good because it will encourage you all to submit lots of questions and then we can have a bit of a discussion at the end to cover some of the things you're interested in. Um, just to emphasise, and I know Edward won't mind me saying this, but you know Edward is very much a distress purchase. Um, if you get to a point where you're having to consult Edward, it's because we haven't managed to put you in a position where you had sufficient clarity, you had sufficient documentation, and all of the family were aware of your plans, and you've come to a position where you're having to consult the litigators and possibly even go to court. So the idea around my part of the talk is to um, discuss some ways in which you can have those conversations earlier, think about the documentation you might want to put in place around your arrangements, any changes you might need to make. Um, also to run through a little bit about some of the tax issues that you might be concerned about. So looking at IHT, thinking about possible changes to that, um, thinking about reliefs that might be available, um, and then talking as well about assets which might not form part of the farm and the business assets and will also be passed down um, and then just thinking a little bit about how we might use those to compensate people in the family who perhaps won't be involved with the farm going forward. So um, you know as Edward's already emphasised if there's one thing you can take away from this it's that you know the earlier you sit down and have these conversations and think about who might be involved in the farm going forward, the less likely you are to experience any misunderstanding and potential litigation going forward. Um, so the way I've structured this, just to keep my slides, is I, I've assumed that um, I, I've drafted the slides to make it clear that whether you have a corporate vehicle, whether you're a partnership, you know the same sorts of concerns and the same kinds of remedies will be available to you. Um, so, you know, I'm going to assume that you are running your farm either as a partnership or you're incorporated. You want to think about making sure that those assets are passed down in a sensible fashion, that succession is dealt with in such a way that everybody understands where they're going. And that if we possibly can, we build in some tax efficiency and also address some of the asset protection concerns that might sit around that. So the main things to think about, so how are your current arrangements documented? Do you have uh, sitting around your partnership or sitting around your company an agreement which helps to explain what will happen should any of these rather more unpleasant circumstances arise? Um, so we're going to look at um, partnership agreements, shareholder agreements and the way we can use those to build in some protection and some certainty. Um, we're going to talk about um, assets which qualify for relief, how you might pass those down now and possibly also how you might pass them down in a will. Um, and we're going to talk about how we can build around those some protection from potential relationship breakdown for future generations. Um, and then we're going to talk about any assets which don't qualify for relief and what you might do with those. So in terms of moving on to look at some kind of um, documentation, uh, the, the NFU is obviously very keen to assist its members in having um, consistent arrangements which provide certainty to families. And so they've done quite a lot of research to find out you know, how farming families are dealing with this and whether they have arrangements in place. And I think it's probably fair to say that there are still quite a lot of farmers out there who are farming in an informal partnership. And there are all sorts of unpleasant repercussions that can stem from that sort of arrangement where you haven't got any sort of certainty over what's going to happen if, for example, partners can't agree what to do next, if somebody would like to exit, for example. So what we would always like to see built around any company or farming partnership is an agreement which will set out, you know, most importantly, how we can break any deadlock. 
So what will happen if people can't agree on what's going to happen next? What we should do if somebody wants to exit? So, and, and really importantly at this point, how we would come to value their share? What would happen if somebody wanted to leave? How would we agree on what should be paid for the assets they hold? Um, and then also dealing with the really unpleasant side of things. So what would happen if somebody lost capacity? People don't think very hard about this because it's obviously unpleasant and it doesn't happen in every scenario, but it's surprisingly common that we've got Holly on the call so she can deal with any specific queries about it later. But I'm going to give you a little um, case study later of what happened to us where we had a farming partnership and one of the partners was incapacitated for a very long time. Um, if we had had some more thinking around that and how the agreement should have worked and the kinds of documentation we could have put in place, we could have saved the whole family a lot of heartache. Um, and then obviously dealing with what happens should a partner pass away. And in those agreements, we would always seek to build in a requirement for any partners joining um, to have a, a prenuptial agreement. Um, th that's always a difficult conversation to have with your children. Um, and we find that by building it into the paperwork, what happens is you can say, well, you know, the lawyers made me do it. OK, I'm not saying casting any aspersions on your possible future partner, but this is in the documentation. It's a requirement. And we have to have that discussion now so we can sort of help you to generate that discussion in a way which is not too loaded. Um, and then we can also look at making sure that you're not in a situation where people can be influenced perhaps to transfer away any shares or interests that they have, um, should they be in a position where they are um, you know, easily influenced or could be taken advantage of. So we can build in those mechanisms, we can set up a way for all of those interests to be valued, and we can make sure that everybody knows as part of that process, sort of where the family is going, how the business is likely to evolve and the sorts of things that you want to build into that. So yes, it's a legal exercise, but it's also an exercise for the family to engage with each other and sort of um, agree on their expectations, even looking at things like you know diversification, which was already on the table and possibly now again might be an issue um, post-COVID, looking at ways in which you might want to grow the business bringing younger generations in and talking to them about how they think the business might look. It just facilitates all of those discussions. So it's not just about the legal side of things. It's also about clarity around how the business is going to be run and what it might look like. And the sooner young people are brought in, of course, you know, the more buy in they'll have to that process and the more successful, hopefully, all of these measures will be. And the less likely you are, sorry, Edward, to have to instruct a litigator. So on the more boring side of things, I'm going to have a little chat here about inheritance tax. It's probably at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Um, now, just as a little summary, you've probably all got as part of your estates a farm and you know the business assets that go with that and also probably other assets which maybe are not involved in the business. So you'll have trading elements and you'll have non-trading elements. Now, as a general rule, Inheritance tax applies to the assets of a married couple to the extent they exceed £650,000 and there is no relief available. So most people who are attending this sort of conference um, are going to have significant potential exposure to inheritance tax. Now, of course, we all know that there are certain reliefs that have been put in place over the years which are intended to enable you to pass down your farming business without having to break it up in order to pay tax and that's a public policy decision um, and and it's obviously quite right but there are ways in which you can fall foul of those reliefs um, and the main ones I want to talk about today are firstly looking at succession those who are perhaps still farming and slightly older, and we know that farmers do tend to um, carry on for a very long time, um, if they do find that they are starting to be less involved in the farm, need to think very carefully about remaining in the farmhouse. One of the issues that I've had the most discussion with district valuers about is um, firstly, the who's in the farmhouse and whether it's still being used for farming purposes. So are we going to get full relief on that? And then secondly, there's the issue around um, the fact that agricultural property relief will only cover the agricultural property of the land. It won't cover um, any additional value. Um, agricultural property tends to be lower than market value. So the holy grail here would be for you to be in a position where you have a combination of agricultural property relief and business property relief, which together will give you as near as damned it 
100% relief on your farming assets. Now, where you could go slightly awry with that is particularly on the diversification side. If, for example, you have cottages and other rental activity, which starts to um, reach the point where it's disproportionate to the amount of trading you're doing, then the whole profile of the business can start to shift. So there are, you know, there is definite mileage in having a look regularly at your profile thinking quite hard about whether or not you're definitely going to qualify for those reliefs on your farming assets. It is not a foregone conclusion. And it's fair to say that HMRC, whilst they have not changed the law on this, they are closing in, I like to call it by stealth, um, just by, you know, being more difficult, just by asking more questions um, and sort of slightly closing down the availability of those reliefs. So we want to make sure that you're in the best possible position. And that means that we all have to be proactive about undertaking audits to make sure that those reliefs are available. We are possibly expecting changes to inheritance tax. It's This has been on the table for seven years or more. Um, and they could affect uh, farmers disproportionately if there is any specific change to BPR and APR going forward. Um, it's probably likely that COVID will put a stop to that. I can't imagine them wanting to overhaul huge amounts of capital tax legislation whilst we're dealing with all of this. So we can probably safely assume it's been shelved for a while. But one of the things you could be thinking about um, and you could look at together with um, your solicitor or an accountant is whether or not it is worth accelerating any transfer of relievable assets to family members during lifetime um, that's to sort of try and bank the relief that's available to you now rather than risking any changes. Now, I, I don't want to put the cat among the pigeons and sort of overstate this. I just want to put it on people's radars where, you know, where the, people are thinking that perhaps it might be the time to start handing over value to the next generation. It's another factor to maybe have on the table at the time. Um, so, the other thing to think about is we've looked quite a lot in detail at relievable assets. What about the assets that you will have potentially like investment portfolios, etc., or, for example, rental properties in your own names, which are not within um, the possible realms of relief? Well, any of those assets can also be gifted. And that's you know, the single best way to reduce your exposure to inheritance tax is to hand over assets and then survive by seven years. That's for assets which don't qualify for any relief. So, um, in many cases, people aren't ready to part with those assets or they are a reliable source of income that they need to live on. And it is never appropriate to consider making gifts where those assets are still required for the funding of somebody's lifestyle. But it's something that people can be thinking about at the right time. And if we can identify the right sorts of assets, maybe to be passing down. And if we're concerned about, for example, um, you know, less than attractive partners or anything like that, then we can obviously use trusts as well, um, where we're trying to gift those sorts of assets. Um, and, you know, often um, there are ways that we can get those assets into structures without triggering a capital gains tax charge. So it needn't be prohibitive. Moving on then to something slightly more distasteful, and we've obviously got Holly here, who's the expert on all of this. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about a little bit of a scary story, just to focus the mind on the issues around incapacity, because we would all like to think that it won't happen to us. Um, but actually, in some ways, this is the poss possibly the worst bit, because while you are well and looking after your assets, obviously you're in control, and that's great. And actually, once someone's passed away, assuming we've done suitable planning for them, we have a will, we have executors, we can get access to assets, we can keep things going, and we're in a good position. The very worst place to be, uh, in my experience as a private client lawyer, is in the twilight zone in the middle. Um, and we had an example of this in our firm, where a client had no lasting power of attorney, um, became unwell. Um, and was expected to pass away fairly swiftly, but actually didn't, um, and was a wonderful fighter and kept going for 15 years. Um, and in the interim, of course, we still had to run the farm, um, keep things going, fund the his wife's lifestyle. Um, and in order to do that, we appointed a, um, a deputy. We appointed a court deputy and Holly's team helped us with this. 
And of course, we were able to put them in a situation where they could keep going and the farm was intact and we were able to make sure that they were all safe and looked after. However, if we had done a little bit of planning in advance, we might have been able to deal with some of these issues in a much less costly fashion. Um, so it's very important, I think, to to consider the risk of this. Let's hope it doesn't happen. It is unlikely. But some of this planning is actually you know, really not particularly expensive to do. Um, lasting powers of attorney cost £82 to register. Um, and, you know, you can prepare them yourselves or we or your another advisor could do them for you. But the cost of preparing them is completely dwarfed by the possible expense of having to then apply to the court to have a deputy appointed. So I would urge everybody, um, including the solicitors here, um, and it's very much physician hill thyself on this, I'm afraid, to have lasting powers of attorney in place. Um, and this is the, obviously the big one and what most people think they're coming to somebody like me for. Um, so, you know, we want to talk to you about your lifetime planning. We want to think about the way you document your business activities. Um, we want to think about lasting power of attorney, but we also want to make sure that we have that discussion. And this is often the starting point, conversely, and that is who is going to receive your assets? Who is going to be the person who may be introduced into the farming partnership um, and then may start to take over the running of the farm? And who are the people who perhaps need to be compensated in other ways? Um, it would be fairly standard planning, for example, for us to make sure that you, if you haven't made any gifts during your lifetime, to make sure that you get your business property and your agricultural property relief by giving any qualifying assets to a trust in your will. It's pretty standard planning and it's really flexible. So that's one of the first things I would expect to see. Um, it means then that your family can agree amongst themselves about um, how things should happen next. Your trustees can be people that you trust. They can be professionals and family members and they can make sure that things are administered in accordance with your wishes, which you would also document alongside this. You can also think about the possibility alongside it of having insurance to perhaps um, ensure that any uh, IHT on your non-relievable assets is paid to protect any um, other assets which are available to benefit those children who will not be participating in farming activities going forward. We would also recommend the use of trusts in your wills where you have perhaps concerns about children's relationships in the future. So that is my rather euphemistic reference there to asset protection. And of course, the big key here is going to be deciding amongst you who is going to be that person or persons who are going to be administering your estates so gathering everything in making sure it's all administered correctly and then if there are trusts they'll be the people who are making the decisions about what happens next making decisions about who benefits and how um, and on what basis you know your wishes should be followed as regards the running of the farm and I think we're going to bring things to a conclusion there so that we can have a look at any questions which you may have posed as we've been going through. And I'm going to reintroduce Edward. Thank um, you. And hopefully Danielle, I think. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Just we'll give um, everyone time. So just a reminder, on the right hand side of your screen, uh, you have uh, hopefully the opportunity to uh, uh, type out any questions. Um, only we can see them, so you can ask whatever you want. Uh, and please do feel free to... Uh, uh, put questions on there. Um, just a couple of things I was going to mention actually in terms of uh, who's best placed to um, help get these discussions going. I and mean, we do a lot of work obviously with the NFU. Um, many of them can, many of their, their team can help uh, facilitate these discussions. Uh, accountants often, uh, they often uh, can be a good way of um, uh, uh, of helping in that in, in that regard as well because they get to see your business very often on a annual basis. So if, if not if not more, but there are others as well that we come across, uh, uh, you know, land agents as well, who can help uh, encourage these uh, these discussions. Perhaps just give you one example of a case that we that we we dealt with a couple of years ago, where the where the estoppel claims came up, and this was a case where a son was trying to uh, uh, take over the farm whilst whilst dad was very much still alive. Uh, there, we ended up. Uh, in a court proceedings, quite expensive court proceedings, but the client took the view that he wanted to try to resolve um, his son's uh, his son's claims, and he had to have regard to his other children as well. And there, effectively, we came to an early deal which divided up the uh, the the farm uh, into the relevant inheritances for the children, so that the child who was making the claim now could be paid off and go the and everyone could go their separate ways. The pragmatic ways in which these can be solved, but obviously, if that planning had been done earlier on, 
uh, and documented, it could have uh, avoided a lot of cost uh, uh, later on. Uh, Danielle, hopefully you're there. We might be getting a few questions coming through. Yeah, um, I've got a couple of questions. This one's probably aimed at Anna, I would say. Um, Anna, we've had a question. Uh, trusts or family investment companies? Which do I prefer? Mm. This is the thing, you see. Um, so a family investment company um, is a posh way of just talking about a company which we design specifically for your family. So it's not sort of magic. Um, family investment companies work best where you're starting with a an asset which doesn't have too much value so that you could create your family investment company with your various classes of shares um, and hand over some of those before the value really kicks in. Um, we, we can create them later on, um, particularly with believable assets. Um, and, and, and I mean, with trusts, I'm a bit of a trust fan. Um, I'm a private client lawyer and a bit of a nerd. And I do, I really like the flexibility that they bring. I also, what I particularly like about trusts is that I think you can appoint people who you trust and give them the power and the flexibility to give effect to your wishes in ways which can take account of the sort of prevailing law and any changes. I mean, the reality is in a typical lawyer cop out that they're quite different beasts and they'll be, they will fit different circumstances. Um, so, I mean, I like I like them both. I'm a big fan of trusts, um, but but a fic can be really useful for the, for, for the right set of circumstances. It's possibly slightly less flexible. Thanks, Anna. Sure. Anna, uh, thank you. The next question was, um, would you advise having these discussions before or after the next generation find themselves in relationships? Uh, I think early planning has always got to be uh, sensible. So I would I would advise start before, but then review it when those new relationships start because um, it, grandchildren, grandchildren, et cetera, come along. So, so um, I think you have to come up with a plan and then keep it under review uh, as life events. I was talking to a client um, yesterday. Oh, sorry, Ed, just, I can't. I, I, can everybody else hear it? Um, occur uh, as the children are leaving school. I think, yeah, I think Anna, your, your reception is uh, your Anna, your reception is breaking up a, a little bit in and out. So um, you're, we're, hearing, <laughs> we're hearing you just intermittently. Yeah. You carry on, Ed. I think what I would just add on to that is, um, so from a mental capacity perspective, um, you don't really uh, obviously know what's going to happen in life at all. And I think that's what the coronavirus has shown us all. And so I don't think there's any sort of one moment in time that's the golden time to start planning or, or not plan. you just got to press on in the, in the circumstances in which you are and, and make the best of it and plan for the best and expect the worst. Um, we've got an, another question that was probably aimed at Anna. Um, our farm is still in my father's name and we are the tenants. We've built another dwelling on the farm and have moved out, moved out from the main farmhouse. Our son, who is a partner in the farm business, now lives in the farmhouse. Is this a problem for IHT? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. We can, Anna. Go, <laughs> well, go, go, go quickly. Okay, I'll go quickly and then I'll be virgin and abuse them. Um, uh, so the, the key to protecting your relief on the farmhouse is to have somebody in it who is farming. So if you have a farming, a partner in it who is farming and it is not a complete um, palace with marble baths, etc., cetera, um, and is in keeping with the farm, then you should be relatively safe. The big concern and what people can sort of drift into is where um, parents or, or older farmers are perhaps winding down and stay in the farmhouse. So disturbing though this is, um, it's, there can be scenarios in which tax planning r requires us to move them out so that somebody who is still farming can be in that farmhouse and provide us with the best possible chance of claiming the relief. Thank you. Um, have we got time for a couple more questions, Edward, or? 
Uh, if people are still asking questions, I don't see why we can't <laughs> carry on. So yes, let's go. <laughs> Great. Um, I have one daughter who has a partner, not married. The farm is run as a sole trader. I am married and would see the farm pass to my husband if I die first. How do we protect the assets for our daughter, but ensure our possible future son-in-law does not benefit if a divorce occurred? Is a trust the best option? That might be one we can bring in uh, Emily as well, actually, there, obviously, because of the uh, divorce angle. But Anna, do you want to kick off? So just from the point of view of um, of the will, in that scenario where there is concern about asset protection going forward, I would usually say that it's wise to consider having a trust of some variety in place. Um, and Emily, I'm sure, will correct me if I'm wrong, but generally... Um, a trust which is for the benefit of children and grandchildren will provide better protection than passing assets outright. However, it is not cast iron. Would that be fair, Emily? Yes, and I think it's important for the daughter, if she subsequently marries future son-in-law, to get her own advice about protecting that asset should she inherit in the future as well. So I think in to sum up, yes, I would think a trust would be appropriate in that scenario um and but i suppose the point to remember is that it should that advice should be reviewed and a prenup should still be considered yeah we've just got one Good. last question if we very quickly yeah um do the Go panel ahead. have any views on separating the land holding from the trading business the land holding could remain in the control of the whole family with the trading business continuing independently. Um, this person says, as I say to clients, you do not need to own the land to farm it. Yes, I can see there's merit in that. Um, it's The thing is, it sort of depends on the appetite of the farmers, uh, you know, of the various family members to to undertake any kind of planning because we do get quite a lot of resistance on these sorts of things. Um, but in terms of safeguarding relief for any trading elements, it would not be unusual for us to undertake some kind of demerger and have segregated almost what we would call in the corporate field a, a sort of operating co property co scenario where we hive them out. And then what we can do is make sure that where relief is available, we are, we've got the best possible situation where we can be sure we'll be able to claim it. Um, and then, you know, the land can be managed separately. So I'm uh, definitely in the right set of circumstances. Um, yeah, I'm, I would be keen to explore that as an option. I, yeah, I would completely agree with that. I think for me, it just emphasises the need when you're doing this planning, you need to take a bit of advice from those advising you in a business sense, the accountants, any other consultant you've got on the farmers how you're structuring and how you're going to fund your series of expertise to help come up with the uh, approach uh, uh, there might be one or two questions we haven't uh, got to and we will and we will come back and follow up uh, individually on those we can see those on, on our system um, I just want to say thank you to uh, the NFU, to Patrick, Andrew uh, and Ed in particular, who've uh, helped uh, advertise this um, uh, webinar for us and for distribute to members. Very grateful to uh, to them. I just wanted to um, uh, highlight a couple of things that we're, uh, we're doing um, at the moment to um, try and uh, try and help uh, farming clients. So uh, the first thing is that we, we introduced a, a while ago, and there's a little image of it there on, on the uh, on the screen, uh, planning for your farm future. It's a legal legal check that we help do where we can uh, sit down with you, same to NFU members in, in Devon and in Cornwall, where we can sit down with you. These days we're having to do it virtually, but hopefully soon face to face again, sit down with you and your family and discuss some of these issues in a bit more detail and provide a bit more of a, a, a detailed uh, a detailed idea as to options you can look at. That's an entirely free initial chat, completely free. Uh, and on the back of that, there is some, uh, for some uh, potential work that you might uh, ask us to do moving forward, uh, are based on that wills, for example, and things like that. There is currently, at the time of uh, having this webinar, some NFU funding, which might be helpful if you subscribe to the NFU's legal assistance scheme. Uh, 
Uh, and then the other thing just to mention, similar to the vein, uh, we're very happy to uh, have a chat over coffee, uh, virtually on the on, on this sort of uh, this uh, sort of electronic format. Um, so if you do want to get in touch and have a chat about any topics at all, uh, please do so. We'd be very happy to um, to uh, speak and see to you. Anyway, thank you all for uh, for joining us, particularly when the weather is so lovely uh, today. I uh, hope everyone has a good day, and thanks very much. And um, please do stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.